Let's take a little time to reveal The prehistoric stories that the earth once concealed Mix them all together on this ancient land It's time to spread some paleo jam Hello, welcome to the latest edition of Paleo Jam. I'm Michael Mills, your host for today. And you can probably hear the wind. We nearly had a cyclone just suddenly blow through. Um, I am with Dr. Adam Yates, Senior Curator of Earth Sciences at the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory. G'day, Adam. G'day. Um, so we're, we're, we're like literally um, in the middle of Australia. Very close to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, a place called Alcuta, Alcuta Station. Um, it's a fossil site where you regularly, like, like once a year-ish or thereabouts. Yeah, once every two years. Once, once every couple of years with a team of folk come up here. Um, before we, we, we talk about the, 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 some of the really remarkable discoveries that are made here, I just want you to describe what's, what's, what's around us. Okay, we are sitting on a small plain that is grassy. So we're on a little grassland. It's actually um, native Mitchell grass grassland. Uh, to our west, sorry, east. <laughs> I get my old bearings correct. Yeah, to our east, we can see um, a line of low hills with flat tops. They are hills that are made of Miocene to Pliocene fluvial sediments, sands and silts capped with a thick band of silcrete. Uh, beyond them, not quite visible from where we're sitting, you'll see uh, a range of hills. They are the Hearts Range and the Strangways Ranges. Then off to our west, uh, we have other low hills that are also made, like the Hearts and Strangways Ranges, made of very, very old rocks. Um, so we're actually sitting in a, a little basin, basically. This little flat plain is are, are developed on top of soft sediments that are filling this micro basin, as it were, lake yep. basin. And in terms of, 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 of for those folk wanting to know like where exactly in the middle of Australia, so we, we've just driven up this morning from Alice Springs. That's right, yeah. So we drove north uh, along the, Plen uh, sorry, along the um, Stewart Highway, then turned east onto the Plenty Highway heading out towards the Queensland border, but stopping before we got to the Queensland border, and then struck north again up a little dirt road uh, and then took some complicated turns to end up on Alcuta Fossil Reserve. So we're actually in a little excision that's been cut out of the cattle station uh, so that it is preserved for its scientific um, value. Value. Because yeah. we're, we're actually sitting... Um under a tree because there's a tiny little bit of shade i think it's the only shade within a square kilometer <laughs> um but we're sitting overlooking where the the dig takes place or at least some of it aren't yes we? yes and and now that you've described what it's like today take us back eight million years ago and if we were sitting in this very spot eight million years ago in these chairs, <laughs> what would we be surrounded by? That's a really good question. And it's one that we have um, are working towards answering as best we can. Uh, one of the difficulties that this um, site throws at us is that it doesn't preserve any plant material. So as Okay, far so as it's just the animals. It's just the animals. So we have to infer from the animals and from other records of about the same age elsewhere in Australia, what Australia was like at the time. So we really are piecing together from disparate lines of evidence uh, a story that is by no means absolutely settled in concrete. But we've got some we've got some ideas. Okay, so it's that thing. I suppose it's like if you on the Nullarbor Plain they find tree kangaroo fossils. So yes. therefore. There were trees. There were trees. <laughs> yes. So you're kind of trying to infer from yeah. the critters that you've got, got here, here, knowing what they eat elsewhere. Exactly. And, 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 and also adapted to eat. And or, also knowing what the record shows. So we don't get any plant fossils here, but we might be able to say get, for instance, a pollen record from 
somewhere maybe hundreds of kilometres away, but at least gives us a picture of Australia's general climate at that time and then infer what was happening here at the site. Yeah, so so you're not going to know necessarily the specific species as we can by sitting here now and looking at what's here now, yeah. but you get a sense of what yeah. was in the neighbourhood. The, yeah, exactly, the, the climate exactly, and, and, and what was happening. So what we actually... The picture that emerges is an Australia that's in a, a state of change. It's drying out. So the global climates are cooling by the late Miocene. So the climatic optimum of the early Miocene, which is when you had lovely lush rainforests all around the East Coast and probably extending to some degrees inland. And that's like, like from, from Sydney to, to Perth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forests kind of all the way through. Yeah, hence, yeah. Hence tree kangaroos on the Nullarbor Plain. Well, they actually came later. They were in the Pleistocene, but that's, that's a whole other story. That's a whole other podcast episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but Australia, so global climates are cooling and that means less rain because basically less evaporation off the seas, global sea temperatures are dropping, and that's really bad news for Australia because we're this very flat continent um, that we are exquisitely sensitive to these global changes in temperature. And so the forests are retreating and it's drying out. So we're sort of at 8 million years ago, we're at the birth of the red centre. Not, it's not in full swing yet, it's just starting so there's definitely still more water here lying around on the surface uh, than today. It's like today it's dry. You won't find a drop of water for many kilometres uh, from, from here unless you go to a rainwater tank. Yep. Um, so back then there were rivers and those rivers were at, had at least permanent enough pools in them. If they weren't flowing year round, they at least had pools that were lasting year round that were big enough to house aquatic animals like turtles and crocodiles and ducks and all sorts of other things. So you find fossils of those animals and you, yes. you all of a sudden... It, it's, it's like if you, 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 you go to Cooperpedi, you're finding things with flippers, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs. It's like, yes. right, um, that's an ocean. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. yeah. So we are, we are definitely not finding oceanic animals. We are finding a lot of terrestrial animals. Um, and another inference that we can draw uh, from looking at the teeth of the terrestrial critters, the, uh, particularly the plant eel, the plant eaters, all have the kind of teeth that you find in browsers, not grazers. And the inference we can draw from that is that there was nothing to graze, i.e. the grass that we are completely surrounded by wasn't here. Uh, so even though it was probably dry, and somewhat open and definitely not forest covered, definitely not a closed canopy forest, uh, we don't think it was an open grassland. We think it was probably some sort of moderately dense shrubland, uh, a bit like a kind of weird ecosystem that's very rare on the Australian continent today, partly because the other, apart from rain being one of the controlling factors is fire is another controlling factor and this is where I'm talking about records elsewhere so records elsewhere in Australia for the late Miocene would indicate that fire was not a common phenomenon the way it is now and in fact we saw that ourselves driving as here. you're driving up there's there's fire you you see and 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 it's, we were talking on the way up about like oh do, do we call the fire brigade or do these things just burn out they generally just burn out at yeah here. yeah yeah it's a long way to come to put out another little fire when there's so many of them dotted around. Yeah, and, and obviously the priority is like... <laughs> the town. The, the, the town and yeah. stuff. Um, okay, so so talk us through um, some of the critters that have been found here to give us a sense of, of what it would have looked like okay. uh, when we were here. Um, because cause we see a lot of megafauna stuff. That's correct, yes. Yeah. So one of the things that this drying and opening up of the environment was promoting was the evolution of larger body size. So we have at Alcuta one of the oldest um, Cenozoic megafauna. Now I was going to say the oldest megafauna but it depends on how you define megafauna. Dinosaurs of course much older and they are 
megafauna. And they're, they're pretty quite big. large. Yeah, some they of are. Them, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> they're pretty famous for being big. So when I say uh, a megafauna, I'm talking specifically the megafauna that we think of when we think of the Pleistocene megafauna. Yeah, the Ice Age movie, the, the Ice Age movie yeah. megafauna. But, that but we're talking about the, the, the Ice Age down under. Yes, stuff. exactly. So we're long before the Ice Age here at 8 million, but things are getting underway. Big size is becoming an advantage. Uh, so amongst the, the crew of creatures that we found here, uh, we find that the Diprotodon family, not Diprotodon itself, Diprotodon had not yet evolved, but its smaller, earlier relatives were actually flourishing. This is practically the zenith of the age of Diprotodontids because we've got possibly as many as six species in this area. And, and sheep size? Sheep size up to uh, bullock size. Yeah, so, 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 and, and, and you're saying they're, they're basically kind of everywhere. There's yeah, yeah, well, certainly well, one of the, the sheep size one, the smallest one, we call uh, Colopsis. Colopsis, yeah. Colopsis is its name, and it is staggeringly abundant in the fossil pits here. Okay, so, uh, again, coming back to that notion of, of what it was like here, and, Firstly, what it was like as, as an ecosystem, and we talked a little bit about that. But the the actual the, the the fossil bed came about. Is it is it a result of a, a, a catastrophe where everything died at the same time, or is it an accumulation? So in caves, you 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 might have an accumulation of fossils. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the KT, there's a catastrophic kind of thing so so what what's the nature because when when we go to fossil sites we're we're looking at things as they died indeed yeah so, so what's the story here for that okay we're still working on that story because it is an it is an extraordinary site it's not typical so this is not in a typical slow accumulation the bones are incredibly dense they are spread over an area of roughly the size of two football fields. Uh, they're in a very thin layer. There's just one layer that's just packed with bones. That layer is at best 60 centimetres thick. And in places it's down to like 20 centimetres thick. So does that suggest a single event? A single event. And the other thing is that the bones are, although they are now very damaged, the evidence is that when they were buried, they were fairly pristine. They were not bones that have been lying out in the sun uh, or, or markedly different ages. Like there's a really old decayed one and there's a nice fresh one. So things that have different histories all brought together in one spot. These all look pretty fresh and all buried at one spot. And the inference being that the layer is so thin that it accumulated very quickly. Um, because if it took a long time, then um, for bones to be basically lying at the surface for a long period of time you know only having 60 centimeters of sediment accumulate over them they would have decayed badly so they, these were buried quickly i think so it does all point towards some sort of catastrophe cat catastrophic bed yep all right so i want to come to um uh a particular critter that um was was has, has just been published um uh, one of the crocodiles that yes. are found here because yes. you find a number of different uh, we've, we've only two so, only two at this site. Okay, two. So, so yeah. tell us, tell us, Baru. Yes, right. Baru Ilunbinya is its name. The um, it's a newly recognised species of Baru. So, Baru is a genus of crocodile that was pretty much the dominant crocodile of at least the northern two thirds of Australia throughout the late Oligocene and nearly all of the Miocene epochs. So, there's 20 million years of history of Baru dominating the waterways. So so we 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 find them in places other than Alcuta? Absolutely. We certainly do. In fact, the type locality for the type species of Baru, which is Baru Darrowi, uh, is Bullock Creek up far to the north of here. Yep. And they're also found at Riversley, yep. famous place, uh, and even south down next to Alice Springs, there's a site where Baru is also found. So it's dotted around basically wherever you get crocodiles in the northern part of Australia that's from either the Oligocene or the Miocene, you'll find Baru. And you find Baru here as well. But this is the last of them, the youngest. The youngest. Okay, so, so what makes Baru 
and this new one, mm -hmm. um, I'll ask you to pronounce it again. Ilunbinya. 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 What? Why? Why is that such a cool thing? What? What? What makes it so okay. special? Okay. Well, Baru is a special crocodile for a number of reasons. One. One of the obvious reasons is it is the biggest predator around in the oligomycene of Australia. So what size are we talking? We're talking a large saltwater crocodile, four, maybe up to four and a half uh, metres in length. And, you know, if we had a bigger sample size, it wouldn't be surprising if we got some that were even over five metres in length, although we haven't found any that were that big yet. Yeah. Uh, so it was big. You know, a four metre salty is a big saltwater crocodile. You don't want to tangle with one of those. But they were more robust than saltwater crocodiles. So an equivalent size saltwater crocodile would have been thinner, more gracile, more lightly built. So we're looking at something, you know, we sometimes jokingly call them salties on steroids. So chonky. Chonky. Yeah, chon ch yeah. Chonky boy. Yeah. All right. So, so what, what does that then tell us about... Um, their their hunting strategy or what they ate and how they ate I that, think, that chunkiness yeah i think what that translates to and particularly a lot of their chunkiness is particularly visible in their snout so they have really deep snouts d with a d-shaped cross section that's quite a strong cross section compared to the much flatter snouts that you get in modern crocodiles so i think they are probably sacrificing to some extent the hydrodynamic abilities for strength in biting and so I think what this means is they were tackling megafauna as the megafauna were, get, were, were becoming more abundant these crocodiles are getting chunkier and chunkier uh, and they were routinely taking big animals more so than a modern saltwater crocodile now a modern saltwater crocodile can certainly take big animals they they'll take roos or tourists um, but they actually subsist on small prey for the most part. Fish, turtles, little things. They, the big things are uh, less frequently taken, whereas I think Baru was probably taking these big guys as a matter of course. That's what it's sort of subsisting on. Yep, and, and so it, the, 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 the species name, Ilunbinya, um where does that come from? It comes from the Amajara language, which is the language that's spoken in the area where we're sitting right now, uh, or one of the languages. We actually sit on a, a boundary of several languages. So you'll find people here who can speak Amajara, people who can speak Alioa or Eastern Aranda. But uh, Amajara was a language that hadn't yet been used. We've used Aranda for a number of different scientific names, and I, it, given it's one of the dominant languages where we are right now, it definitely needs to be used. So it's an, a Madura word that means good at hunting or skilled hunter. And given what you've just described. In yeah, terms it's of it, perfectly it's, described. It's pretty good at hunting. So I'm, I'm interested, what, what's the protocol in terms of using? Well, uh, we, I actually just consulted with a linguist Yep. Uh, and used the uh, Madura to English yep. language dictionary, which is published by cool. the yep. Um, yep. Indigenous Australian... Yep. Uh, I can't actually remember the name of the organisation that publishes that dictionary, but anyway. So, but it's uh, a cool thing, though, isn't it? it, yeah. it to, 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 because it reminds us, as Australians, of, of the history of this place that, that you know, that I... I I love that that where I come from, further down south, um, you know, I'm on Ghana country and and often go hang out in the Flinders Range, mm -hmm. Adnyamatna country. There's there's a story of of Diprotodon, um, and there's a story of Yamoti, and we think right. it's the same animal, right? And okay. and because in some parts of Australia. Uh, you know, the, the the some of these animals, obviously not the case with these because we're talking eight million years ago, but the ancestors of the folk that you might be sitting with, mm -hmm. and you might the folk Ghana or Aranda, their saw ancestors saw as a living animal. Yeah, you know, and that is that is such a cool thing that being yes in Australia. Yeah, yeah, and we definitely need. Us. Yeah, we need to. Uh, recognise more deep Australian history and use more of other Australian cultures, you know, the, the original Australian cultures yeah. in, in, in um, bringing, you know, science to the to, people, to, to all life. the people. To all the people, yeah. 
Um, so, so Baru is a particular type of croc, isn't it? Mika Sukune. Mika Sukune. Mika Sukune. So, so where 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 does Baru sit in the family of crocs? Because there were other crocs in Australia, like Quincana, which was more of a terrestrial thing. Yeah. And I love the fact that it's got its eyes on the side. Yes, indeed. Less less so on, on the top. So Baru actually was a bit like modern crocs in that its eyes still pointed up. So Baru was probably still using water as its ambush. So it was probably an ambush hunter, whereas Quincana, you know, like eyes out to the side, was probably hunting around on land. But- I'm sorry, I'm just... just- <laughs> Like it's 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 a trouble enough like with with tourists in the northern territories like keep away from the rivers because you but like y- y- you'd be in danger of having a quincana lurking behind the tree the shady tree that you've just sat under. yeah yes yeah. it's quite mind blowing isn't it so Australia has always been this place where everything wants to kill you <laughs> <laughs> well I think that's pretty much most of the world most I wouldn't, of the world isn't you know it, yeah. I I wouldn't be feel safe running around in the African felt. Uh, Back in the Pleistocene. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Okay, so these Mikasurines. Mikasukines, yes. Mikasukines. T- yes. Tell us okay, so how, they, do, how do they all fit? Okay, so they are a group of crocodiles that are each other's closest relatives. So they are a natural group, an evolutionary offshoot. Uh, and we're not 100% sure where they fit in. They're, they're definitely more closely related to crocod- uh, modern crocodiles than they are to modern alligators. So they're on the crocodile side of things. Uh, and in the past, they've been classified as actually very, very close to crocodilus crocodiles. But as we're learning more and more, as we find more and more mucosukines and include more and more data in our analyses of their evolutionary relationships, they've been drifting down the tree a little bit. So they're actually starting to move away from the crown group of crocodiles. That is all of the living species of crocodile and their common ancestor and moving uh, what um, phylogeneticists would call stemwood. They're moving down the tree. Uh, so they're, they're, But we don't know exactly, and that hasn't settled yet. We haven't settled that argument. The other thing we haven't settled is where did they come from? How did they get to Australia? That's a fascinating question for me. Well, I will ask you that question. <laughs> where did they come from? Like, so, so, you know, Australia is known as the place where salties are, freshies yeah. as well, but, but salties in particular. Um, and, uh, but... Are we where crocs began? No, we are not where crocs oh. began. Or at least, at least we don't think so. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, the modern crocodiles, like the salty and the uh, modern Australian freshwater crocodile, they are members of the genus Crocodilus. So they are actually recent newcomers to the Australian continent. Um, indeed, probably um, the coming in in the last few million years. And, yep. and so, yeah, being actually being replacements for these Mikasukins. So these Mikasukins were like, like Australia's marsupials had been here for many tens of millions of years. We find the oldest ones in rocks that are close to 50 million years old at Mergen in Queensland. Those are the oldest Australian Mikasukins that we found so far. So they were already in the continent by then, which is a long time ago. Hmm. Um, but the question is, where did they come from? Because they don't appear to have been around in Australia if we go back to the Cretaceous. Uh, there, although admittedly our Cretaceous record is pretty poor, you know, we've got things like Isis Fordia, which is not even a true crocodile. It's a crocodile form. Uh, it looks like a crocodile, but if you get down to the nitty gritty of its anatomy, it's not actually quite a crocodile yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a croc with trainer wheels. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so we had these things. Uh, and then we've got a big gap in our fossil record. And then when we, the fossil record picks back up again at Mergen, we've got Mikasukin crocodiles. Um, I think, and we're starting to get clues now, that there's a, a range of crocodiles or crocodile relatives that were living in Asia in slightly older times. So we're going back to the Paleocene Epoch or even the late Cretaceous. Uh, these I've only newly been recognised group uh, in the last few years, and we've given them a name. We call them the Orientalisukines. And they actually look to me and to some of my colleagues, like Yorgo Rostevsky, uh, they share a lot of anatomical traits with the Mikasukines. So my hypothesis, which I've yet to fully support, yep. uh, is that an Orientalisukine made an epic ocean dispersal event from Asia down to Australia 
before Australia had even fully broken away from Gondwana. So it crossed that area which is now filled with all the Southeast Asian island archipelagos but wasn't yeah. then because Australia hadn't yet started its long trek northwards. Uh, and it made an oceanic crossing and got into Australia that way. Uh, back in, say, the very, very early uh, early first days of the Cenozoic era or possibly even in the late Cretaceous. And that's the thing, isn't it? You, you, you see similarities in a thing that's somewhere else and you compare it to the thing yeah. that's here. And and that, like, could, that could be convergence. Okay. It, it could be convergent. It doesn't yeah. have to be it could be convergent. evolutionary relationship. But, but, and, and I guess that's why you do more digging, more discovering, yeah. more yeah. analysis, yeah, more exactly. of that detail So stuff. I think what I need to do is get some grant money to go to Asia and start looking at some of these Oriental Asukines. Look, and then we could do a podcast from there. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, so look, we've got... About four minutes left because right. time flies it when does, you do these it? things. <laughs> um, I guess just just to, to in the, the last few minutes, I just want to kind of reflect, go back more broadly again yeah. to what this place was like, what we're looking at. So, um, and 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 what it's like when it's here as a dig site. So, where we're sitting. There's a, each of these little places we're looking at um, have names. They do, yes. One of them, one of them is Shattered Dreams. <laughs> yes. Okay, Shattered Dreams was a pit that we opened in 2013 when a mate of mine uh, managed to wangle the use of a backhoe from the local uh, municipal council. So we got a backhoe operator and a backhoe out here and I wanted to open up a new pit that lay between this one that we're directly in front of which is main pit and another one that's over there called south pit oh and by the way main pit is is where the the baru ilumbinya holotype was found holotype was fine so we're basically looking at it right yeah, over we're, there we're literally just three or four meters from where the holotype skull was dug up yeah so back to the shattered dreams shattered dreams so uh in 2013 we had this backhoe and we were digging down and I told the guy with the backhoe look the bone layer is about 90 centimeters down so go down 50 centimeters uh, and then start going slow uh, and he I'm sensing he didn't go slow well it surprised <laughs> us he in the first scoop in the first it was for some reason it was really high there and so the first <laughs> bucket came up and it was just bones falling out everywhere so he's, <coughs> he's, he's broken them all. Uh, it turned out to be fantastically rich. Most of the things, even when we started excavating there, most of the bones at that particular little subsite are badly shattered, hence the name. But it was full of pretty much everything we wanted to find. We found thylacine bones there, wackaleo bones, everything. All so wackaleo is, is a small version of thylacaleo. The marsupial so, lion. Yeah, so, so how much size. smaller? About leopard size. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right, so coming back to Beru in the last couple of minutes, um, and probably all of them, while this is a, an individual catastrophic event, obviously none of the things that we find are alive anymore. No, no, we're, we're far, back, far enough back in time that um, all the species that <coughs> were around then have either evolved into something new or gone extinct. Yep. So, so, yeah. so what, what, what <coughs> happened to the Mikasukines? Um Probably climate change. Uh, so as I said earlier, this is the last time we find burrow in the fossil record. You don't find it in any younger sediments. And indeed, it's the last time we find a number of crocodile genera. Um, the late Miocene or, so, or slightly older in the middle Miocene is like the last time you find Trilophosuchus, the last time you find Mikasuchus on the Australian continent, the last time you find all oh, this and that. So a whole bunch of them. So the, uh, But it's not like crocodiles stop. In the younger rocks, in the Pliocene sediments, we find a new cast of crocodiles. We get Paludirex, we get True Crocodilus and a bunch of other ones like Gungamarandu. So there are new crocodiles and something happened and I think it was a drying out. I think we had a pulse of aridity that was pretty severe, so much so that these inland rivers that these guys were living in stopped flowing. Baru went extinct. Then things got a little bit better, the river started flowing again, new crocodiles came in. 
on that note, Dr. Adam Yates, thank you so much for bringing me out here and for the chat. Oh, I love it. It was great. Thank you very much for having me. It's time to spread some paleo jam.